Welcome, everyone. It is the first episode of the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian Show. I'm Adam the Bull, and he's Zach Meisel. Zach, how you doing? Are you excited today? I can't believe it. I've been waiting for this since you came to Cleveland. We can <laughs> finally really? talk baseball. <laughs> I love it. And every, folks, if you're, I, I tweeted this earlier. If you're a casual baseball fan, you'll like this show. If you're a diehard baseball fan, and contrary to popular belief, there are a lot of diehard Guardians fans here. You will love this show. We are going to get into baseball minutia, something that is rarely done in Northeast Ohio. And that's all coming up right here. Man, my voice is squeaky. I'm like Peter Brady on the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian Show. A lot of money for those graphics for that intro there, Zach. I mean, that was a, a big time spend. You and I are getting paid virtually nothing because we had to spend about 50 grand for that little music and intro. So you are, we should tell folks that, that you are in Arizona still. Are you enjoying, I, I, I guess at this point, you're probably done being in Arizona. You're ready to come home, see the family. Are you not? I mean, I know you've been home a little bit, but you've probably had enough at this point. Yeah, the dog days of March are a real thing, and it's not just for me. I'm not going to complain too much, at least publicly, about <laughs> what I get to do for a living. But uh, the players feel it. The coaches feel it. Everybody feels it. Um, I think there's a consensus around the league that spring training could be shorter. So you get to this point in camp, and it's like, let, let's go. Come on. Let's, right. let's catch that flight, go to opening day, and let's get the show on the road. You say that, though, yeah. and then wherever you go, at least for Cleveland's sake, it's a lot colder, and then you miss the the Arizona sunshine. So here we yeah, are. That's true, and, um, you know, you're on, it's on, on the West Coast to start, although, you know, it's Northern California and Seattle. It's not like it's in L.A., but um, it, the weather here is beautiful today in Cleveland. It's in the 60s, but the next two weeks after today are supposed to be kind of around 50 degrees, which is not unusual for this time of the year. Folks, for those of you who may not know, um, maybe you're new to one or both of us. I have no idea. If you're a big baseball fan and you're a big Guardians fan, you've got to know Zach. It would be pretty odd if you didn't know who Zach was if you're a big Guardians fan. In fact, I probably couldn't call you a big fan if you don't know who he is. But by some chance, there's one person out there that doesn't know who Zach is, of course. He is the Guardians beat reporter for The Athletic. Uh, he and TJ Zuppi do their own podcast as well. You want to promote that there, Zach? Tell us about it. Yeah, the Selbius Godcast, named after, it's a deep cut, but uh, <laughs> Bill Selby, who famously hit a walk-off Grand Slam off Mariano Rivera, and the next day people showed up to the ballpark with cardboard box boxes that said Selby is God, and we decided to use that for a podcast name. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's this is this is crazy. This is my 14th season on the beat. Mm. Um, you so don't seem old enough. Yeah, I feel it, though. Um, you do? I found a new gray hair this morning too. So, mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, and it's, it's, this is weird though. You know, at 13 seasons and 11 were with Terry Francona as manager. So this is new. I think things are a little different and it creates a layer of curiosity and intrigue that is different from what we've become accustomed to. Yeah, no doubt. And we're going to start there as we do the off season recap in, in just a moment, folks. Uh, jump in on the chat. Make sure you, if you haven't subscribed to the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show, you hit the subscribe button, and uh, we'll be with you every every week. Uh, we we're gonna figure out a couple of days because uh, sometimes three o'clock won't work, so we may record it a couple of times. But we're gonna try to be live as often as possible. Uh, still working out the opening day plan with a five o'clock game there, and the uh, Guardians play in Boston in a game that starts at 11 o'clock, but uh, most weeks will be live at 3 p.m. on Monday. Zach, let's start with the the with exactly what you said. This offseason, the biggest story, unfortunately, for the Guardians this offseason is not about adding players. It's about adding a new manager. And uh, I, I know you, you've spoken to Terry Francona many times. I had a chance to speak to him early in spring training, and he seems relaxed and happy and enjoying watching college basketball i'm sure he's locked into the tournament right now but i wasn't in arizona and i didn't get to interact with Stephen vote in fact you interacted with Stephen vote even before that apparently you stalked him and went to his home um but what's your impression of him at this point in, in heading into his first season yeah i i think there's 
an understandable level of skepticism anytime someone is hired like 15 months after they finish playing. So it, it's you see why. You see how he was able to win over Cleveland's front office in interviews. He is a really good communicator. He remembers who you are. He remembers details about you, whether you're a player, a fellow coach, a reporter who's filling in for someone for one day. Um, and those are the things that matter where he's there. He's going to have to learn the X's and O's and he's going to have to learn kind of how to approach this job. You know, what do you say after you get swept on the road and you've got a cross country flight home? Like, do you, you have to say the right thing. You have to push the right buttons. And that's, those are things that only happen with experience on the job, but he was, nothing ever came easy to him, right? He was a late bloomer. He was, didn't go to a big school, wasn't a high draft pick and was, he was 25 years old and was a third string catcher in a ball and had to work his way up and had to do that in a lot of ways by building relationships with people so that they would give him a chance. And all along, I mean, he played 10 years in the majors and built himself into a two time all-star, but that whole time he was thinking about coaching in the future. And anytime he had an opportunity, whether it was when he was in the minors when he was injured, he was with the brewers in 2018 and was out for the year he asked the coaching staff if he could learn and shadow them. And I think that prepared him well, whereas he's probably more equipped for this job than most people, 39 years old. But Mm -hmm. saying all that, so much depends on the players, so much depends on the rapport he builds with these guys. And that's going to take some time. So it's it'll be interesting to watch. Um, And I feel like we're already seeing some things that are maybe different just in terms of Roster construction, no doubt. Lineup construction, but we'll have to see how that goes. Let's before we get to that, because obviously we want to talk about Miles Straw and the roster being set. But you know, the final thought on the off season because it's been a terrible off season for the Guardians. I, I, I'm frustrated. I know. I know the diehard fans are frustrated. Do you um, want to list all their big moves really quick? Yeah. Well, Austin okay, Hedges. That's all of them. They Austin Hedges. They trade for Scott Barlow. They signed Ben Lively, I think, to a one-year, $1 million contract, and that was it. They they didn't non-tender Ramon Laureano, who you thought maybe they would. Um, and so they spent, between Laureano, uh, Austin Hedges, and Barlow, you're talking, what, $18 million roughly? Yeah. Um, and, and I just look at that, and I'm like, could that have money? And you and I have talked a lot about this off the air and when you came on my podcast, but, man, Zach, I'm just like – that, that money, especially when you see like a good a, a good solid player like Adam Duval, who could easily be second on the Guardians in home runs, signed for three million dollars or whatever it was, four million dollars, and you're like, couldn't you know? Wouldn't we feel better about this team if he? And I'm not saying he's great, but if he were patrolling center field instead of Estevan Florial, wouldn't we feel better about this lineup a little? I would. Yeah, I, I think there are two lanes they could choose. And they're driving straight at the fork in the road. And like, I understand certain elements of it. You have guys you, you have to get an answer on whether that's Will Brennan, because you traded for Florial, you have to get an answer on him. He's out of options. Mm -hmm. Um, Tyler Freeman, Arias, Rocchio, et cetera. But how do you play in this division? And you have they have a good nucleus, right? Jose Ramirez, Josh Naylor, Andre Semenez, Stephen Kwan, Bo Naylor. Yeah. That's a good starting point. It is. The rotation and the bullpen went healthy. They could be major strengths. How do you play in the AL Central where it might only take 85 wins to win the division? And because you have a really good pitching staff when healthy, you would presumably be built to win games in October. How do you not capitalize on that? And do more. And so when they traded for Scott Barlow, who only has one year left, closing experience, could be a really good reliever, and is making almost $7 million, I thought, oh, that's that's a win-now type move. But that was it. Yeah. So, so it was a very peculiar offseason. You know, they trade, they dump Cal Quantrill, which, fine, if you want to save the $6.5 million. But to, to use that money to sign Scott Barlow and then do nothing else is is bizarre. You know, they hung on to Shane Bieber because the trade offers were weak and he looks like he's poised now to have a big season. Yep. So there, there, are, there are elements here that make you think, you know, this team 
has some talent and then they could be going places, but they didn't do anything to upgrade what was one of the worst lineups in baseball. Yeah. And that that makes you scratch your head. And the least powerful lineup. Later, we'll answer your questions if you sent them to us on Twitter. Uh, there's a lot of chats going on. If you send us a question in the chat, we'll try to read it, but I apologize if we do miss it. But the roster is now set, Zach. I know you you reported, uh, I can't remember now if it was Friday or Saturday, on the roster changes. And you talked earlier about uh, being different with Stephen Vogt. Now, I can't imagine if Terry Francona were still here that they would have done what they did with Miles Straw. And I was stunned. And you and I talked off the air. You were surprised as well. I, but I love it. I love that they took Miles Straw off the roster. I saw somebody, who was it? Um, Oh, it was um, uh, Tom Withers. Tom Withers was like, still no report yet on uh, whether uh, Miles Straw is going to accept his assignment to AAA. And I'm thinking, Tom, I love you. I know you're the AP guy and AP, you know, they got it. But there is zero chance he is not accepting that assignment because the whatever guaranteed money he has left, which I think is close to 20 million over the next three plus years, he would lose all of it because he would have to sign probably a minor league contract. So there's zero chance that he is opting out of that. And there's, I'd say, 0.00001% chance that somebody's claiming that contract. He is going to be the one of, if not the highest played minor leaguer for hopefully this entire season. Yeah, I don't know much about the uh, outfield dimensions at Huntington Park in Columbus, but <laughs> I think he's going to get familiar. I, yeah. On one hand, I give the Guardians credit for making that move because they know what they have in him. And it's not high on the priority list because... All the outfielders we just mentioned who need some run. On the yeah. other hand, they probably shouldn't have given him that contract extension. No. I think that's safe to say. Mm. Safe to say. So, yeah, they're they're in a weird spot. You know, we've seen them eat money like this in the past. You know, maybe not to the extent of having three years left on your deal, but it's their problem is they make a mistake with Swisher and Bourne or with uh, Josh Bell, and they wind up eating some of this money, but. It scares them off from doing other things. I hope that the Miles Straw extension doesn't scare them off from trying to lock up some of their other young guys. Um, but I, it, it always was a weird one to me. It got overshadowed when they did it because uh, it was the same time that they were negotiating with Jose Ramirez and Emmanuel Class A. Right. So we didn't think too much. But for a guy who was always a light hitter, who was always about speed and defense, guaranteeing him a bunch of money as he got older... It's crazy. Seems strange because those are skills that would go away. It, it it's one of the dumbest moves this front office has made. And if you look at their whole time as the Guardians front office, it's been a lot more good than bad. But the last couple of years, it's not. There's been more bad than than usual. And this move in particular is just. It's going to hurt for a couple of years. But when you look at the rest of the roster, I think another interesting guy that made the roster. Wait, wait, wait. What are you going to do with your Miles Straw jersey? That's what everyone wants to know. I think I gave it away already. Mm. I can't remember what I did with it because I had to wear it when he hit the home run. And uh, Tyvis was asking me, you know, he said, oh, I think he's going to hit three home runs this year. I'm like, yeah. He, he, said, he has like seven in his career. Do you know there's one pitcher, Jordan Lyles with the Royals, who somehow has been in the league for about 13 years? And his numbers every year are terrible. Yes. He is the only pitcher to allow multiple home runs to Miles Straw. That's not, I mean, I guess I was going to say it's not a surprise because he stinks, but it's still a surprise because Straw has so few home runs. I mean, he's got to have the least amount of home runs per at bat of any player, I would say, since probably at least the early 80s, if not the 70s. You know, the 70s and the early 80s, you'd see guys like him who, who couldn't hit home runs, play shortstop, play center field, even play second base. But nowadays, it's just unheard of. What if they did like a home run derby at the All-Star game with guys who couldn't hit home runs? And then basically like the first one to hit a home run wins? Straw, some pitchers. I think you might be on to something here. Yeah. I think Straw would lose to pitchers. There'd be at least a few pitchers. You know, uh, Madison Bumgarner, although he's, is he retired? Well, I don't think he officially retired, but he's not on a team. There are some pitchers that can hit. You know, bring maybe bring Kerry Wood out of retirement. He was a good C. hitter C. back in the day. Who was that? CC Sabathia. CC can hit, no doubt. I mean, can a retired pitcher hit more home runs? That's a TV show right there. Hit more <laughs> home runs than Miles Straw in a home run derby. Um, 
One guy I wanted to mention, David Fry. You know, he's obviously a third catcher, which is unusual to keep a third catcher, but he has the ability certainly to play other positions. Do you think part of the re you know, it's funny because you have Miles Straw who can't hit, and then Austin Hedges, like those guys are essentially the two worst hitters in baseball or two of the worst hitters in baseball. Now, Hedges is a backup catcher, so in that role, he's fine. I wouldn't have spent the $4 million, but still. But do you think they 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 kept Fry here? Because they essentially don't want to let Hedges hit ever. Like in the games he's going to play, okay, he'll get two at bats, but then maybe we'll bring in. I don't know because you you have to be you have to be able to pinch hit for Hedges late in any game. I think that would be a smart way to use him. Yeah, right. He can play first, third, left, right, and also the role that he is supposedly going to occupy is one yeah. that Stephen Vote occupied throughout his career. Vote was a catcher, but he played in the outfield some. So. I think there's an appreciation for what Fry brings. I think that's part of why he made the roster. And and yeah, if if you're remember last year they opened with Zanino, Gallagher, and Mabry's Valoria, <laughs> which should be a trivia question. Oh my but god. The thought was that they oh. would pinch hit for their catchers. Yeah. So they'd carry three of them. They never did that. I think Valoria batted like four times in a month yeah. and then they cut ties with him. Yeah. Um and you can do that this year, but like Fry yeah. is a much better hitter than probably all three of those guys last year. Bo yeah. Naylor should be at least in the lineup at least five times a week, if not Admitted. more. Yeah. Yeah. So so there's there are ways to maximize all three of these guys, I think. You know, Hedges can be yeah. a good defensive option on the one or two days a week he starts. He doesn't need three or four at bats. You've got Fry there if you want to give Bo Naylor a day off. Let's uh, quickly go through the rest of the lineup here. Man, you and I could do probably two hours. I'm like, the, uh, Mike was like, the show's got to be done in 32 minutes max. We're already halfway done with that. And I'm up to like item three on the 10 items we had on the list. But uh, so, so when we talk about the positions that were up for grabs in spring training, you got DH, center field, and shortstop. Let's start at shortstop. I'm excited about Brian Rocchio getting this opportunity. I saw, I mean, listen, I don't want to give up on Gabriel Arias, but he got an opportunity last year and he did nothing with it. I like the fact that they were aggressive with him, you know, because we're a little disappointed they weren't aggressive with Kyle Manzardo and having him here. But the fact that Rokio is the guy at short and Arias is going to play more of a utility role, I'm excited. What about you? Are you excited also? Yeah, because this is another example of new coaching staffs and new perspectives, right? So yeah. I think a lot of us assumed Arias would get the first crack at it because He's sort of further along in his development, and it's now or never. But this is a group who didn't watch Arias every day last season. Okay. So they loved what Rokio did in the offseason. I uh, won a winter ball title with Venezuela, and um, they feel like it it helped him a lot. He had an okay camp. Arias did not have a good camp. Neither guy really like seized the opportunity and ran with it, which they no. were hoping would happen. Um, but I think because of that, why not? If you're hoping someone takes it and runs with it, go with a guy who has at least done a little bit. And also who, you know, Arias, it's very clear what his issues are. He just, for some reason, cannot hit left-handed pitching. He's still going through some swing mechanic yeah. changes. So go with the guy who maybe has the better chance of doing what you had hoped instead of, oh, we'll go with Arias first. If he doesn't cut it by June, we'll switch. Yeah, you know, it's, I think it's a new way of maybe thinking about things. Isn't it sad though that, like you talk about, like neither of those guys really had a good camp, and not the camp means anything. I mean, Miles Straw actually hit well in spring training this year, but but uh, you know, Florial, who they're hoping can develop, and Florial, you know, a few years ago was one of the best prospects in baseball. It doesn't always work. We've seen that here, aka Matt Laporta, you know, and many others since. But but um. Florial, every time he's had a chance in the big leagues, which has not been a ton, he hasn't done anything, and he feels like a 4A player. For those who don't know what that is, it's a guy who's too good for AAA but not good enough for the majors, and they kind of bounce up and down, and really that's their career. Hopefully he's better than that, but things very unsettled, I would say, right now. It'll be him, it'll be Freeman, it'll be Brennan, maybe all get the chance at center field. Nobody said a DH either at this point. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think like Quan will play every day. I think Ramon yeah. Laureano is going to play a lot. Yeah, I think Freeman will probably get the bulk of center field duties. And then, yeah, you just try to fit those guys in where you can. It is it is tough, though, because it's that chicken and egg scenario where 
you want to get an answer on Floreal, but how often are you going to play him? How are you really going to learn about him? So that's why they're just they're caught in this weird spot where it almost would be easier if they would just say, you know what, we're probably going to lose 100 games this year. Floreal, go get 500 at bats and we'll make a final decision on you. Arias, same thing. But they don't want to do that. And in right. the central, you shouldn't do that. So they're ca- kind of just hoping that someone gets hot for a couple of days. They keep them in the lineup and, you know, they don't look back. All right. This is the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian Show. Make sure later today you check out the Ultimate Cleveland Brown Show with G. Bush at 5 p.m. Zach, pitching staff, um, Carlos Carrasco, he's back. It's a great story, but he was god awful for the Mets last year. He looked shot. I thought, like, as a bullpenner, he could be interesting. But because of the injury to Gavin Williams and some other injuries, guys banged up and Lively may not be ready to go. Curry may not be ready to go. We'll see if they start on the IL. But but Cookie's going to get the uh, fifth starting role. How did he look in, in spring training? I didn't get to see much of him on TV. He looked all right. I think a little better as spring went on. Um, you know, he's not going to throw 95 anymore. So for him, he was trying to like the sweeper is everybody's favorite pitch now. And so he added one of those and he's trying to just, I think the days of him hoping to throw 200 innings and get 200 strikeouts are long over. And so now it's more of just, how do you get quick outs? How can you last get through five or six innings? Um, he's, he just turned 37. You know, it's crazy Mm -hmm. to think when he debuted for Cleveland, it was September 1st, 2009. Brian Rocchio was eight years old. I think his catcher that day was Kelly Shopik. <laughs> so actually, Jensen Lewis pitched in relief of him that day. So, you know, it's been a long time. Um, and I don't I don't know what he has left, but I feel like what better, and he feels like this, what better yeah. place to, to find out? If this is the last yeah. chapter, you know, either go down swinging in Cleveland or go out a hero in Cleveland. So yeah. And if he's, you know, even if he's serviceable, listen, you have, it's not like they have any good options right now. Um, you know, Hunter Gaddis does nothing for me. I, I, I'm fine with it. And then, you know, hopefully Gavin Williams, when, when, we, when do you think Gavin Williams is going to be back? Probably at some point in April. Okay. So even if it's May 1st, so, I mean, you Carrasco make three starts, four starts, whatever it is. And then, you know, maybe settles into a bullpen. I could even see him. Because I could still see him in an, for an inning looking good. I could see that. I think it's going to be hard for him to pitch well as a starter. You just got to keep him in the game. You know, yeah. but that's hard because for the Guardians, keeping them in the game might be giving up no <laughs> runs. Right. I mean, the thing that helps is that you have, like, they have so many guys who are out right now that yeah, he just has to hold down the fort and you can figure out a role for him later, you know, a more permanent role. Um so it depends, like it depends who they get back first. You know, they'll probably get back a couple relievers first, or at least Sam Hentges. Um, and then you go from there, but like you don't have to rush anybody, let him get comfortable for a few starts. And the good thing about him, because he knew he had to fight for a roster spot, and Bieber went through this too. Like both of them were at the driveline facility in Scottsdale, and they were working on things early on. Um, so they're a little more ready, you know, they're not like easing into the season at all. Right. So maybe that helps. You know, um, we're going to answer some fan questions, folks, in just a second. So hang in there. You talked about the injuries of the bullpen. Hentges, hopefully back soon. Karen check. Um, obviously, Trevor Steffen's out is gone for the year, right? It's it's the whole year, right? He's going to miss the year. And uh, but but those are three guys that have all been at times effective. Karen check obviously been up and down. So it's an opportunity for some other guys. I thought it was funny, and we were talking about this off the air, that on that board, you took a picture of it that, that where the Guardians roster was locked in. It said, for the last relief pitching spot, it said Cade Smith or, or you know, somebody from another organization. I can't remember what the exact wording was, but do you do you think they're going to be aggressive here on the waiver wire? And I, I wonder, like, you see, uh, I can't remember who cut them, but C.J. Crone is a guy. I, I know it's I'm, we're talking bullpen, so, so it's a little bit. But CJ Crone just got cut. I wonder if they'd consider that for the DH. Although, although I guess with first base DH, they're just going to wait and call up Kyle Manzardo, you know, by the end of the month or something. But and that's the thing because they should yeah. have signed JD Martinez if you want a first baseman yeah. or, or DH. DH. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you're right. You know, if Kyle Manzardo's up in a month, yeah, then 
then you wouldn't have had a spot for him. So yeah, uh, the bullpen. So I'm glad you thought that that was an official roster. That was my yeah. shoddy handwriting. Um, oh, I, you wrote that? That was then. That was the third attempt at it too. I, by the way, I'm an idiot. I thought I thought like you took a picture of that from the Guardians. I didn't realize that was you. The first I I started oh, to scribble God. something on a napkin and then realized no one yeah. would be able to read it. Then I started no. scribbling it. Couldn't read my handwriting. Had some right. mistakes in it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I you never know with the external right. editions this week just because it depends on who everybody is keeping on their roster if right. an interesting name pops up. I feel like because they have somebody, like if Cade Smith makes the team and they have a 17-inning game or someone gets hurt in the first week, yeah, yeah, right. I don't know who they're going to turn to. They've, they've run out of pitching. So that's yeah. why I think if they find, if someone interesting pops up on the waiver wire, that they might go and try to grab them and send Cade yeah. Smith to Triple A just so they have a little bit of insurance, but that's true. You never know. Yeah. I saw Jesse Chavez, but I think the Braves just signed him to a minor league contract. Uh, Quick break. And let me tell you that the ultimate two one six show is on Thursdays at 5 PM and the ultimate Cleveland Cavs show with your buddy, Jason Lloyd, if he could stay out of trouble long enough and the Mikey McNuggets on Tuesdays at uh, 5 PM as well. All right, let's get let's get to some fan questions, Zach, because we're getting low on time here, and I I, I want to see what the, we got some questions from the fans, and they're excited to be a part of this. A lot of people are excited. We got a lot of people watching right now. We appreciate the love. Uh, let's get to some questions. Here we go. If I can find the right thing on my phone. Here, uh, okay. Is it too risky to? This is from Evan at E dot Light. Is it too risky to sign the lauder to? One of those early extensions teams have done with prospects before they hit the majors. By the way, there was no way he guys played like what eight games above a ball at double A last year. I know he had a good camp. He wasn't going to make the team. Fans have a right to be pissed about Manzardo, not really about the lotter. But uh, what do you think? Are they you think they're working on one of these deals? We just saw the Rockies do it with Ezekiel Tovar yesterday. Any chance? What do you think? So I know they've had contract extension discussions with some players. I don't know if I don't know that Delauder's in that mix. Uh, they're risk averse in general. I think they're very risk averse when it comes to signing someone with that little experience. I will say, the one risk you'd have with him is he has had like Zadrunas Ilgauskas type foot injuries, so that would make me a little nervous. I I think he's going to be a really good player. Yeah. Um, a year from now, I'd be more interested in that. I the Manzardo is he's the one that. Right, I thought would have made some sense because yeah. you wouldn't have had to give him a ton because of his position, and you could have started him on the opening day roster and not uh, cared about service time. But yeah, I don't think but, that's in the cards either. So, yeah. you think this? They've had some uh, some extensions done around this time. Any chance we see something with Naylor? Or I mean, I guess I don't know who else it would be of the current guys. Bybee, Quan. They haven't done a, a pitcher extension in forever. True. However. You have to like at some point you have to break out of the mold that you're in, and they did it with Jimenez, right? We had not, yeah. you know, I know Jose is different because he was willing to sacrifice so much money, and they had nothing to build around. Um, but they have to have some sort of foundation here, and because Bybee gained a full year of service time last year by finishing second in Rookie of the Year, he's one step closer to free agency than Gavin Williams or Logan Allen are. So, yeah, it could happen. All right, uh, we did uh, – my man Ryan, who's also in my fantasy uh, baseball league, he he wanted to ask us about the draft, but we're running low on time, so we'll save that for another time. I know a, a few other people asked about, like, where we see the Guardians, and let's get to that. Let's get to some quick predictions. Uh, where we this – you and I were talking about this before the show. This division is wide open. I, I, I It is hard to pick a division winner. I honestly don't love any team in this division. If you told me that – that that the Guardians, Twins, or even the Tigers won the division, I could buy it. If you told me, I think you could make a case for all five teams potentially finishing under 500. I don't think that's impossible in this division. Now, it won't happen probably, but still, I in the end, I'm going to go with Minnesota to win the division, but I, I, I have the Guardians and Tigers right there. I have the Guardians second, Tigers third. I have them finishing within a few games of each other. I just couldn't pick the Guardians to win the division, even though I think they can, because I just think that there's way too many holes in the lineup for me to trust it. 
So a couple things here, and I'll try to keep this short, and I'll try not to cop out too much here, but because this is the toughest thing. So many people have asked yeah. over the last month or so, where do you see them finishing? What's their record? What is your general sense? And I've said, like, I the range of potential outcomes here is like 73 wins to 93. I mean, I why you, I, that I, high? Well, I can dream up, you okay. know, things fell their way in 2022, right? So True. Sometimes you just have that season where you maybe win 10 more games than you should. And if you dream up the second half where Bieber's having a Cy Young type season and the rotation stays healthy, I think Williams could be really, really good. He's Love got him. like ace level stuff. Yep. Bybee, we saw what he did last year. A full year of McKenzie makes a big difference. Um, and then imagining a lineup that has Manzardo and DeLauder filling a couple holes and also getting to midseason where you feel good about your team and you actually make a move like that. <laughs> I know it's crazy talk, but buy. Well, I mean, that would be amazing. Look, I yeah. think I'm not saying they're going to win 90 games. I'm saying, yeah. and especially in this division, beat up on the Royals and white Sox. Maybe that helps. Yeah. You know, what I try to do is every front office keeps their own data on like projections for what they see each team winning. Right. And the consensus I've gotten is the twins are the favorites even internally from other teams and the tigers and the guardians are a couple games behind them. Right. And yeah. when it's that close and when you're not talking about teams that are going to win 98 games, it's an injury here. It's a promotion here. It's a young guy breaking out here. That makes the difference. That could happen. I think the tigers probably feel the same way. Um, so, and even the Royals will be better. Yeah. You know, the white Sox stink, but the Royals will be better. They'll be competitive. Hey, they overachieved in 22. They underachieved in 23. I could see them being in the middle of that, which is, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say it's impossible that you could win this division with 83 wins. I, don't, I do not think that's impossible. I, maybe it's pushing it, but they got a shot to win the division. Zach, we've got about 30 seconds. You got a final thought? No, I mean, I until I learn more about what this is going to look like, I just like the safe guess is a 500 team. Yeah, somewhere around that. Couple over, couple under. All right, we're going to be doing the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian show every week. Most weeks, Monday live at 3. We will be back next Monday, and we'll recap the series in Oakland. That if they, That's if they can survive. I don't know. Are they still playing in Oakland? I don't know what the hell's happening there. For Zach Meisel, I'm Adam the Bull. We'll see you next time on the Ultimate Cleveland Guardian show.